this is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Zion United Church of Christ here in Union, Missouri. I am excited to be back. Thanks for welcoming me back. I was on vacation the past couple weeks, um, and it has been, it was lovely, it was restful. I'm excited for the rest of the year, and I'm already uh, starting to plan for Advent. woo because that's just right around the corner. Um, but it, it occurs to me, before we get too much further started, uh, I want to acknowledge the shooting in St. Louis on Monday. Uh, it's tough still. I know a lot of us are still in disbelief. I know that it was almost a numbingness to the whole situation. Um, and even when it's even closer to home than some of the more recent experiences, it still causes us to pause. What's been really interesting, um, as a person who collects books of worship, it's been started to being added to prayers and tragedies that happen. There are moments, there are prayers, there are poems. Now, so this poem from Meta, Car Meta Carlson is for after a shooting. It happened again. We feign disbelief, but if we are being honest, we can believe it. We must, since this hate is born of us. Each time our hearts break and feel the suffering like a wave, but the passages cauterize, closing off so we can live with ourselves again. There is a fear that flows through the veins of this nation, through the depressed depressed in the souls of men and unleashed in the bodies of innocence. It rumbles between each gunshot. It will continue to rage, stealing breath and beats from God's beloved to power the terror that is still weaving through the maze of our dead-end hearts. There is still more to grieve. There is still work to be done. And so, as we begin worship, and we will continue on, there will be good news in this day. But for the time as we begin worship, we honor those who were lost, we honor those who stepped up to serve, and we continue to surround the communities both near and far with love, with care, with tenderness, knowing that there is still good work to be done. Let us Worship God.
Come from every direction, north, south, east, and west. Welcome and worship Jesus in this sacred place. Come bearing all your gifts, behind the scenes, quirky, unique, and more. Let us welcome and worship Jesus with zealous authenticity. Come with all of, you, of who you are, heritage, identity, belief, and all. Let us welcome and worship Jesus with our whole selves. Let us pray. Welcome us, us. loving Jesus, as we now welcome you into our hearts, minds, and worship. Let us transform and be transformed by each other so that we may perceive your presence among us ever more clearly. Amen. Our first reading of scripture is from Psalm 46 from the Common English Bible. God is our refuge and strength, a help always near in times of great trouble. That's why we won't be afraid when the world falls apart, when the mountains crumble into the center of the sea, when its waters roar and rage, when the mountains shake because of its surging waves. There is a river whose streams gladden God's city, the holiest dwelling of the Most High. God is in that city. It will never crumble. God will help it when morning dawns. Nations roar, kingdoms crumble. God utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. Come, see the Lord's deeds, what devastation he has imposed on the earth, bringing wars to an end in every corner of the world, breaking the bow and shattering the spear, burning chariots with fire. That's enough. Now know that I am God. I am exalted among all nations. <clears throat> I am exalted throughout the world. The Lord of heavenly forces is with us. The God of Jacob is our place of safety. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Please rise in body or in spirit for our opening hymn, number 507.
Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to, late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For God gives sleep to God's beloved. We want the world to change, but so often we refuse to change ourselves. When we confess our sins, we join in the transformation of the world. Please join me in a spirit of prayer for our responsive prayer of confession. We crowd each other out, clamoring for glimpses of and glances from Jesus. We got caught up in the hype, buzzing with energy, adrenaline from the crowds who wouldn't. However, in doing so, we neglect the quiet opportunities to welcome Jesus into our homes and lives. Forgive us, Holy One, when our excitement outweighs our commitment and our dreaming distracts us from the work at hand. We need not fret over our mistakes and mischances of years and days past. God is forgiving and gracious. We are liberated from the things we cannot change and empowered to influence the things we can. No matter where we may go, God is always near. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, I have a few announcements for the good of our community. The first is that uh, both the events for Hope Ranch um, this afternoon and for Camp Mobile are going to still continue rain or shine. Um, so if you've been making plans, just dress accordingly. Um, but those events will still be going on. Um, second, following today's service, um, we will be holding our budget hearing. Um, so next week will be our um, fall meeting um, that is officially taking place. Today is simply an opportunity for us as a congregation to review the proposed budget and to ask any questions um, at that time. Um, it'll help us speed up the, the process next week and it'll give you a time to truly just focus in on the budget today. Um, and then last, um, this past weekend, so over the past few days, was our conference, the Missouri Mid-South, uh, our conference annual gathering. Um, over the past few days, Alicia and I, along with Gil and the Clemmies, um, gathered both either in Jefferson City or online um, to review the ministry and the work of our conference. Um, it was really great to both be back in person um, and also recognizing the fact that when um, Alicia and I left yesterday morning, we were able to make it back in time for meetings so that we were able to attend virtually on Zoom so we didn't have to wait until 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening to start driving back. Um, it was a really great opportunity to be with the conference. It was a really great time to connect as colleagues and as other partners in ministry um, and really learn that we have a great opportunity not only in our conference but in all of our local churches that we continue to prove that throughout the past few years that we have been more flexible and more adaptive to the changes and the challenges at hand than a variety of other denominations, and that the continued network and the continued support from one another has really helped to increase our commitment to one another, and we have found that there is a great uh, faithfulness among our conference, and it was just so very good to be with them. Um, and two kind of special notes. Um, within that meeting that I just want to acknowledge and recognize. Um, our conference has uh, confirmed the appointments of both Alicia for our, one of our General Synod delegates. So this coming summer at, uh, in Indianapolis, Alicia will represent um, our conference to the General Synod. Um, and also, we want to particularly thank uh, Matt Herring, um, who was our liturgist this morning, um, but he has accepted the role of the conference treasurer, so he will be on our conference board. Um, and it's just really great and important work. He's stepping up, um, and so we're really thankful for him and for Alicia for their continued commitment to our conference and to the work that's going on. So if you would, give me, help, join me with a little round of applause. Thank you once again to Matt and Alicia for that. And with that, it is out of the generosity and support of the friends and members of this congregation that continues to support, the, particularly the financial support of this congregation. It's through our offerings that we not only are able to pay the bills, but to continue to do the work of ministry in this place. 
And so it is time to give God our thanks and praise for a blessing on these gifts. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our doxology. prayer of dedication. Thank you for choosing to receive these gifts that we now share with you, gracious God. Bless each offering, including our very selves, and let every single one be given in service to you. Amen. You may be seated. The second reading of Scripture comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through town. A man there named Zacchaeus, a ruler among tax collectors, was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he couldn't because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus, who was about to pass by. When Jesus came to that spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay in your home. So Zacchaeus came down at once, happy to welcome Jesus. Everyone who saw this grumbled, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household because he too is a son of Abraham. The human one came to seek and save the lost. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. You may remain seated as we sing together our next hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Hymn number 61. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. 
Better doesn't always mean good. Comparison is tricky. Things can be going better and still not be good. When we consider our life, when we consider our world, or even one day compared to the next, just because something has improved doesn't mean it's good. Now, it can be good that it has improved. Trending in the right direction is typically helpful. If I told you I slept better last night than I did the night before, I'm not really telling you how well I slept. I could have slept sound, nice eight hours, uninterrupted, felt refreshed and energetic upon waking up, or I could have gotten less than four hours of sleep, I couldn't stay asleep, I was restless, and then woke up in a panic. Both scenarios could be better than the night before, as long as the night before was worse. Better doesn't always mean good. We can be excited and even impressed by certain areas of our life or for the world for getting better. We can congratulate and encourage those making the world a better place and still recognize that things aren't good. There can be really good and important work being done, which in and of itself is good and loving and kind and gracious, and still not be able to call the situation good. Multiple truths can be held simultaneously. The kingdom of God isn't just a better world. It's the world as it should be. It's a world of love, justice, peace, and goodness. It's God's will on earth as it is in heaven. It's not just better, it's actually good. From the beginning of Jesus' ministry, particularly named in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus has consistently been announcing that the kingdom of God is at hand, that it is near. This announcement is particularly, as Jesus claims, good news to the poor, liberation of the captives, defending the orphan and the widow, and letting the oppressed go free. How we perceive the world, or how we imagine it, drastically affects how we show up in the world, and ultimately how we participate in it. When we think things are starting to get better, when we start to see things as good, if we think that we can contribute something to the world, if we can make a difference, then we start acting as though we do, can. We start showing up and start participating in the world as though we can change it. Whereas when we think things are going wrong, we start to hoard, we start to hold on, and we start to believe that, that nothing we do, no matter how good, nothing will ever get better. So our perception of how the world is and how we work in the world matters. Perception is a skill of discernment that requires patience, diversity, and community. And so as a faith community, our perception is vital to the work and ministry we do. So it's important that we perceive our world, our community, our very lives, not simply as they are, although that is very helpful, but as God and as Christ sees us. Jesus doesn't typically just ask for people to do better. He often wants people to do good. And so we are coming to the end of the church year, and so we're starting to have some of these final stories of Jesus' ministry um, while he's out around Galilee and around the surrounding area. Jesus has entered Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, and by the end of the chapter, Jesus will send two disciples ahead of him to go and fetch a colt in order to ride it into Jerusalem one Sunday afternoon. So this scene in Jericho is one of the final public appearances of Jesus before what we know as Holy Week will come to pass. As Jesus enters the town, a supposedly short man named Zacchaeus has climbed up a tree. We know that Zacchaeus was not liked by his community, so whether he was short or whether he just wanted a better view, was making his way up a tree so he could see this Jesus person that he had been hearing about. He climbs up a sycamore tree, which I think is really fun that they name what kind of tree it was. And when Jesus sees Zacchaeus, apparently Jesus knows about him, because he knows Zacchaeus by name, calls out to Zacchaeus to climb down from the tree and to... Jesus invites himself over for dinner, uh, which is really great. But so Zacchaeus is excited that Jesus has invited him over to dinner, that he saw him, and so he climbs down this tree, and that's the end of the story, right? 
but it's not. See, after Zacchaeus climbs down, the whole crowd grumbles. This is fun. Right? It's a very, like, we, we've been in communities, we're in a church, we hear grumbling when that person gets some type of treatment or is all of a sudden recognized or honored, you can hear the murmur in the crowd. You can hear the grumble. And while Zacchaeus is happy to have Jesus over and he scurries down that tree, the crowd is grumbling. The same crowd who gathered excited to see Jesus is grumbling. And this was at the end of Jesus' ministry. The word would have gotten around by now about who Jesus was and what he was about. And they still grumbled even though they knew that he dined with sinners and tax collectors and the like. And so the crowd was calling Zacchaeus a sinner. Now, we don't know his full backstory. We don't know how he got rich. We don't know his life. But Zacchaeus' name means something like pure. So it seems Luke is suggesting that Zacchaeus might, in fact, be righteous, although that's not entirely clear because it could also be ironic. But Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord after this grumbling in the crowd, Look, Lord, I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them back four times as much. Over the years, Zacchaeus' character has been in question due to poor translation. When the crowd grumbles, Zacchaeus explains himself to Jesus. And you might have it in your memory that Zacchaeus, this wee little man that we sing about in Sunday school, was promising to do something in the future. But as David Luce, a former professor at Luther Seminary, points out, contrary, and I quote, contrary to most contemporary translations, including both the NRSV and the NIV, the tense of the verbs in Zacchaeus' declaration are present rather than future. That means Zacchaeus isn't pledging, look, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back them four times as much. Rather, Zacchaeus is boasting, probably in response to the grumbling of the crowd, look, half of my possessions I do give to the poor, and I already pay back four times as much, as in right now, already, as in a matter of practice, end quote. David Luce goes on to explain that in the entire Gospel of Luke, when you read through in the NRSV or the RSV, that the translation, that this is the only instance where translators decided to use this verb tense as a future tense. The CEB, which we read today, has corrected this error, but our perception of Zacchaeus might still not have changed. After all, we still want Zacchaeus, who was accused by the crowds as a sinner, to justify himself. We want a good reason why he, above everybody else in the crowd, is able to have you know, Jesus invite himself over to be their guest. How you feel about Zacchaeus might be a matter of translation, but like the crowds, it could just be a matter of perception. Historically, we do know that Roman taxation was brutal. We know it was at a very high rate. Zacchaeus might have been better than other tax collectors, but it doesn't mean that he was good. Two things do remain unclear in today's story. Was Zacchaeus independently wealthy, and exactly why does his community begrudge him? To the first point, if Zacchaeus was independently wealthy because he was both a chief tax collector and a rich man, we don't know if he was a rich man because he was a chief tax collector or if he was a chief tax collector because he was already wealthy. So he might be able, as an independently wealthy man, to be able to collect the bare minimum from the community to keep Rome off their backs. Remember, Rome was going to collect their annual tribute. They had a minimum requirement. If the tribute wasn't paid, the military would show up, and if there was any resistance to Rome starting to collect on their tribute, they had some pretty you know, interesting ways of dealing with it, right? They crucified a lot of people. So, Zacchaeus is trying to make sure his community isn't led to crucifixion. And so it was once again, right, it's a matter of perception. Yes, he was collecting, but maybe he wasn't collecting as much. Maybe it was better, but it still wasn't a good scenario. He was still collaborating with Rome, but somebody was going to have to collaborate with Rome in order to help keep them at bay. 
So we don't know exactly who Zacchaeus is and what he's doing. But we have to remember that it was the crowd, not Jesus, that calls Zacchaeus a sinner. Jesus doesn't seem to be bothered by Zacchaeus' wealth. Jesus isn't bothered that he is a tax collector. Jesus offers no negative critique of how Zacchaeus has accumulated his wealth, how he spends his money. All we know about from Jesus is that he asks Zacchaeus to come down from the tree, and he says, Zacchaeus, you should invite me to dinner. That's all Jesus really says. He doesn't make the same critique. Zacchaeus offers this understanding that he already is giving away half of his possessions, that he makes sure that he pays people back in case they have been defrauded. Zacchaeus is rich and a tax collector. But Jesus also reminds the crowd that he's also a child of God, a son of Abraham, all of which are named in the text. Jesus here doesn't seem to be anti-wealth. After all, he knows Zacchaeus by name and invites himself to his house so that he could be taken care of with his hospitality. Maybe Jesus magically knew this man, or maybe Zacchaeus had a reputation that preceded him. And Jesus was seeking him out, knowing that he was both faithful and a good host, or someone who was clamoring to be one. It is safe to say that Jesus, throughout the Gospel of Luke, is anti-greed, anti-unfair business practices, anti-taking advantage of the poor, but Zacchaeus is doing everything he can to do right by his community. He is being a faithful and good neighbor. When Jesus says the human one came to seek and save the lost, he is referring to Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus isn't lost because he was in the wrong or sinning. He was lost because the community had left him behind. Zacchaeus doesn't repent in this story. He isn't called to change his heart or life. Jesus scolds neither him nor the community, by the way. Jesus affirms that Zacchaeus has welcomed salvation into his home as a child of Abraham, meaning a faithful member of the community. Salvation has been brought to his entire household. So this story isn't a story about repentance and forgiveness. And if it isn't about repentance and forgiveness, then what is it about? Perhaps it's about our tendency to jump quickly to judgment. Often our gospel states that tax collectors and sinners, and it's easy to just lump them into one statement. But simply being a tax collector does not apparently make one a sinner. How quickly are crowds today in our world ready to judge someone as a sinner? At whom do we still grumble? Maybe the story is about perception, about how we perceive, how we perceive the work that happens. Just because something is getting better doesn't mean it's good, but just because you don't like something or someone doesn't mean it's wrong. Not everything is for everyone. This really is a beautiful story when we slow down with it. We might want to rush through it. We might want to get on with the story where Jesus will enter Jerusalem and have his final encounters with the temple and ultimately his crucifixion. But the story also slows us down before we rush ahead. It helps us just enter this text and enter this community where things can be simultaneously true. Because it's also true that sometimes grumbling is justified. Because I'm also happy to note that within the story, Jesus doesn't rebuke the crowd. Sometimes grumbling is part of telling the truth. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Zacchaeus would be, therefore, working with Rome. But Zacchaeus was also a beloved child of God, a son of Abraham, who, like all of us, has received the scandalous gift that is and was grace. He didn't repent, He had no change of heart or mind, and he received grace anyway. But because he got down from that tree, he was able to welcome salvation into his home. When we slow down with this text, we are gifted not a story of repentance, but one of grace and grumbling and welcome. It has me wondering, what trees do we need to climb down from? Where have we become spectators when we should be participating? What are we still grumbling about? What grievances need a bit of fresh air? Are they simple, simply 
nuisances, or are there real problems that we have? How do we welcome salvation into our homes? If salvation is about grace and not about repentance, then perhaps salvation has more to do with what happens here and now than sometime later on. Maybe it has a lot to do with welcoming the presence of Christ into our lives, who continues to offer us peace, love, mercy, and grace. As I mentioned earlier, the past few days I spent time in Jefferson City with our Missouri Mid-South Conference at our conference's annual gathering. It was the first time since the pandemic began. And I have to admit, the hotel was just okay. The schedule came out late, which made me upset. The food was just fine. There were grumblings about COVID, numbers, pet peeves, and all these things that we lost along the way. We grumbled about stubbornness and missed opportunities, but it was real. It was true. It was good. Because we didn't just grumble. We showed up. We showed up for one another. We supported one another. We learned to trust one another. We inspired one another. We commiserated with one another. Yes, there was grumbling. And yes, we invited salvation into the room. We didn't just do things a little little better than we have over the past few years. We did something good and true and beautiful. And we caught a glimpse of the world as it should be. We climbed down from our isolated vantage points and joined the dance. It was a wonderful time to connect, to witness the good work being done all across this conference. And more than anything, I realized how proud I was of all of you for the good and faithful work that you have continued to do over these years. How good and faithful faithful and flexible you as a congregation are. How I am so grateful for you all, for the ministry that you help me carry out each and every day. For all of you who continue to show up week after week or month after month, for you who continue to greet one another with smiles and hugs and genuine concern for one another. Yes, we grumble, but I often believe we invite salvation into this space because every time we gather, it's been good. It's been really good in a world that will beat you down every time I enter this building, every time I enter, every time I gather in this sanctuary, and I'll say most times, maybe not every time, I join a committee meeting, start talking about our problems, we start to address them. We start to work through them. I'm honestly, I'm proud that there is arguing and grumbling that happens in this space because we start to address the problems that need to be addressed. We don't just simply dust, you know, shove them under the rug. And so just like our conference, our congregation is doing well because when we show up, whether in person or online, we show up for one another and because of one another. There are so many good people in this congregation and in this conference that remind us again and again The world is filled with far more grace than we often give it credit for. Sure, things aren't perfect. There is a lot of brokenness in the world. There are a lot of problems that still need to be solved. But that just sounds like a good excuse to get together. I'm starting to believe that when we gather, that when we gather in love and care of one another, when we gather to do the good work of grumbling, when we gather to change our perspectives, to gain a little perspective, when we show up to do the work in meetings or in fellowship or in worship, that if you're paying attention, if you're careful, you might just start catching a glimpse of the kingdom, the world as it should be, the world as it could be. You might start catching a glimpse that things are, in fact, not just getting better, but that there is goodness all around, all the time. If only you look for it. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Holy and gracious God, When we get overwhelmed, we often find our ways up 
the tree. Try to see above the crowds, O God. Try to remove ourselves from the the busyness, the bustle of the crowds. We're trying to get a glimpse of you, O Lord, from these high vantage points. But you constantly ask us to come down, to meet you where you are in the midst of the crowd, in the midst of life itself. Help us to enter your beloved world, O God, knowing that things aren't perfect, that there is so much work to do, that there is so much brokenness, but there are so many good people committed to your good work, committed to building a better world. Grant us the courage, O God, to not simply be dreamers, but to be doers, to not simply contemplate, but to get to work. Help us to continue to be faithful. Help us to remember that when we gather, we do so in love and joy. And that that is the work that you will call us to. It's not simply fixing the brokenness, but celebrating the joy and the grace and the love of each day. Be with us, O God, in our lives and in our world. And so, God, we pray for the world for all of those who live within it, for everyone who calls this beloved creation of yours home. We pray for communities near and far. We pray for your love and your generosity. We pray for your, we ask prayers, O God, for our loved ones, for our neighbors, for the strangers who cross our paths, and even for our enemies. We pray finally, O God, for ourselves, that you may meet us where we are, offering your grace, your love, your peace, your healing. And and we follow, and as we continue to pray in the way that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our closing hymn. This is a day of new beginnings, hymn number 355.
as you go from this place. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and bring you peace, knowing that there is nothing you can do, nothing in the past nor things to come, nor anything else in all of creation that will ever be able to separate you from the love of God, which we have come to know in Jesus the Christ. Go in peace this day and always. Amen and amen. Thank you.